Hey guys, my name is Tommy Dimsdale with the National Association for Gun Rights, and I want to welcome you to another History Hour production where we take a step back into the past so we can better understand our future. So today, we're focusing on the Battle of Cowpens, a battle which uh, presented a critical moment in the fight for our independence as a nation. The men that fought and died here ensured that Cornwallis' southern campaign would end in failure, leaving him to retreat to Yorktown where... Spoiler alert, General George Washington would later lay siege to Cornwallis and his men, marking the end and victory of the Revolutionary War. But before we go any further, please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel down below to keep up with everything the NAGR is doing to protect your Second Amendment rights and, more importantly, what you can do to help. Uh, and stick around to the end to see how we can relate the Battle of Cowpens to our own political battles of today. Very interesting. Uh, the year of 1780 had seen numerous hotly contested battles in South Carolina. The British had fought their way rather easily uh, through the Southern Campaign so far, starting at Charleston and heading north, brutally leveraging force and aggression on thousands of South Carolina patriots. Eventually, their progress was abruptly stunted when they came up against the forces of the local militia and over mountain men at the Battle of Kings Mountain. If you'd like even more context, click on the link below, above uh, to watch our special on that event. I do think that you'll enjoy it and it'll add a lot of context to this episode as well. So, during the waning months of 1780, a cold winter swept through the Carolinas, leaving Cornwallis to retreat uh, from Charlotte deeper back into South Carolina, while he sent the ruthless Master Tarleton to the western frontier to exact revenge uh, for what happened at Kings Mountain just a few months earlier. Um, once again, we cover Tarleton's brutal tactics in more detail in our Kings Mountain video. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, we were not able to get any footage of the displays, the maps, or the educational materials in the, in the Welcome Center as the rangers of the Calpins National Battlefield have very strict policies on banning anyone without a mask from entering their premises as we were instructed to leave, as ordered by the Crown. As thousands of Americans are now losing their jobs over tyrannical COVID-related federal mandates, I personally will not comply with any of those related mandates, and the Rangers of the Calpins National Battlefield really should be ashamed of themselves for banning people from the tales of how we gained our independence. I, I find it odd, you know, they only allow you to see how we defeated the last tyrannical king if only we'll comply with the mandates of our current one. And the men who fought and died on that, on that that uh, for our freedoms on that hallowed ground would be turning over in their graves, and I let them know that while I was there. Feel free to let them know that as well. But for now, let's focus on the story and introduce a new hero to our tale, Brigadier General Daniel Morgan of Virginia. Morgan had been dispatched from Major General Nathaniel Green to rout the advances of British forces in the Southern Campaign. Morgan had served the Crown in the French-Indian War and suffered a musket ball ripping through his bottom left teeth and shooting out his upper lip. During his service, he was also sentenced to 400 lashes for striking a British officer. According to Morgan, the man delivering the beating lost count, only, only delivering 399 lashes. Morgan would often joke that, I'm still the creditor to the amount of one lash. Morgan was known for his charismatic nature and around his men, uh, keeping their spirits up and encouraging loyalty to the cause with his good-natured banner. But, regardless of his charismatic whims, Morgan was faced with a daunting new task that grew more and more bleak with each new report. Bannister Tarleton was advancing on his army at a rapid pace, but Morgan had not yet gathered the forces nor the resources to stand against him. He wrote back to General Green requesting to retreat until his provisions and quantity of fighting men had improved. He wrote, The enemy's great superiority of numbers and our distance from the main army will enable Lord Cornwallis to detach so superior a force against me as to render it essential to our safety to avoid coming to action. Nor will this always be in my power. No attempt to surprise me will be left untried by them, and situated as we must be, every possible precaution may not be sufficient to secure us. Tarleton's, Tarleton's scouts had soon sniffed out Morgan's position at Grendel Shoals on the Packlet River and set off the pursuit on January 12, 1781. For four days, Tarleton's men closed in on Morgan and his army. Morgan knew he would have to take on the fight, but he would make sure it was on his terms and not theirs. The Continentals cut down trees and created obstacles to slow the British pursuit, tiring and delaying their efforts. The harsh, muddy, and swamp-like terrain made it hard on both armies of men. Uh, but finally, on January 16th, Morgan was forced to flee to the Cowpens. Tarleton was so close that most of Morgan's men had to leave a hot breakfast behind in order to escape. Finally, 
Morgan resolved to position himself in the best manner possible in a well-known place known as Hannah's Cowpens. In those days, ranchers from the mountains would utilize these cowpens as resting areas for their cattle to graze, and these fields would sometimes be used as a, a cattle market for people to buy and sell and continue their way to the coast. Since it had been used for grazing for so long, there was no underbrush to be seen, just several rolling hills through the pasture that Morgan was determined to use to his advantage. Even though outnumbered and outgunned, Morgan knew this was his best chance to fight. Because refusing to fight can sometimes mean death, both from a military standpoint and even today from a political standpoint. We'll get into that a little bit later. But that night, uh, he was telling all of the younger gents how they would all, all they had to do was fire three volleys at the British lines retreat and all the girls would soon swoon over them as war heroes when they returned home. He told tales of the French Indian War and slandered the British at every opportunity. And he was doing everything he could to boost the Patriots' morale for the coming fight in the morning. On the other hand, the sinister Bannister Tarleton had been pushing his men since 2 a.m., pressing the advance so that many of them were already strained by the time they arrived at dawn on the cold January morning on the 17th. Morgan had already prepared his lines, though. Seeing as how many of these men came uh, from the Battle of Camden last summer where the lines broke and chaos ensued, Morgan deliberately set his men between the Broad River and the Packlet Rivers to discourage retreat and force a fight with the enemy head on. On the first and furthest line, he stationed 150 of his sharpshooters and skirmishers from Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. These men were instructed to fire three volleys at Tarleton's forces and then swiftly retreat to the next knoll where militia would be waiting. Tarleton ordered his dragoons to ride out and survey where the battle lines were and where their enemy lied in wait. The initial fire from Patriot forces was impressive, initially warding off the dragoons and routing them back to the British lines. But now, Tarleton did have some idea of where they were and ordered his men to not prepare to fire, but to fix bayonets and charge the opposing force. Skirmishers picked off and harassed Tarleton's men as they advanced, but eventually retreated back to the second line where 300 men from Andrew Pickett's militia awaited their assault. Morgan was there with the militia when the British reached their lines and rallied the men to hold the line as long as possible. Even though his order to fire three volleys wasn't able to be followed, the two volleys that Pickens' militia did deliver impacted a devastating effect on the British, with some units receiving up to 50% casualties. And with Morgan ordering them to take out as many officers as possible, the British assault would be substantially less organized going forward. However, the order to retreat was given and the militia scurried back to the third line of defense. And seeing this retreat, the Royal Army assumed it was a replay of the devastating victory at Camden with militiamen breaking ranks and fleeing the battlefield. Overconfident in their advance, Tarleton ordered a charge over the hill, further enveloping them in Morgan's trap. As the militia retreated behind the third line, Tarleton's 17th Dragoons chased them around the Americans' left flank. Fortunately, William Washington's cavalry units were waiting in reserve and rode out to meet the 17th Dragoons and forced them all the way back to the British lines. The militia then moved to reform their lines with the Continental Army, presenting a massive force against the whole of Tarleton's advance. The British were shocked to see what awaited them on the other side of this small berm as the Continental forces opened up on their ranks, devastating and breaking the British lines. Tarleton made attempts to flank to the left, but found his men bogged down in the mire, giving Continentals time to maneuver and meet that flank. The order was given for the right flank to retreat and reposition to address the threat, but a mistake was made and the entire Continental Line began to break and retreat. This spurred on the British's false sense of victory and caused them to advance again. Morgan quickly gained control of the situation, which tended to actually give the advantage to the Americans. As the British were lured deeper into Morgan's trap, they found themselves in the middle of what is known as a double envelopment and became surrounded from three sides. The advance which had caused them to fight deep into the American lines left them with nowhere to go once Morgan reorganized his troops and trained his guns on the remaining Redcoats. William Washington and his cavalry had made it up to the front lines by now and proceeded to cut down dozens of British regulars, and during the skirmish, William Washington personally took on Tarleton, both men on horseback. The passion of the Continental Army swelled as they saw Washington duking it out with the man that had called so much pain and strife for their fellow countrymen. Curses and insults rang above the clashing of swords as the two men strained to land bl blows on one another. During climax, one of the skirmish captains, uh, Captain Anderson of Maryland, led an assault to take two of the grasshopper three-pounder light cannons the British had levied at the American lines. 
in a cinematic fashion. Anderson used a spontoon to vault over the first cannon, fighting off the British men manning it and capturing the artillery. This left Captain Kirkwood of Delaware to advance and capture the second one. As the battle raged on past an hour from its first shots, the toll on British forces began to show through. As the Continentals surrounded the Redcoats in the double envelopment, panic spread throughout the ranks and British regulars surrendered en masse, leaving Tarleton and a few of his officers to flee the battle. This fight would prove most devastating to the British cause as 110 lay slain, 229 wounded, and 529 captured. In contrast, only 25 American troops were killed and 124 wounded. Morgan played against the odds and won, but only after planning, preparing, and acting. This was the only time a double envelopment had been utilized in the war for independence, and thankfully it was successful. Morgan, facing possible defeat, braved the challenge, and thanks to his courage, Cornwallis abandoned his campaign to take the South and fled to Yorktown where the Revolutionary War would come to an end, ensuring our freedoms for centuries to come. And in this, we can draw a very important lesson, and that's fighting battles even if we know we may not win. In operating many legislative battles across the country, we've seen multitudes of politicians not want to lift a single finger for our gun rights, claiming that now is the time, or it won't pass, or that's not how things work here. But what these short-sighted and lazy lawmakers fail to see is that there is always something to gain in fighting for what you believe in. Whether that be fundraising for your cause, getting a roll call vote, or just raising awareness about the issue. If we were to take Morgan's mindset of fighting our battles regardless of the outcome, perhaps we might start to see the same results, and that being victory. Just like in 2012, the Sandy Hook shootings had greased the skids for all sorts of rampant gun control to run roughshod over our liberties. Obama and his gun control thugs were pushing from every angle to not let a crisis go to waste. And while a very large, well-known, and capable gun rights organization decided to stay on the sidelines because of fear of defeat, NAGR stood in the doorway and they fought, regardless of the outcome. While the other organization gave props and support to Republicans uh, who agreed to placate the enemy by adding amendments to make the gun control less bad and therefore easier to pass, the National Association for Gun Rights held the line and demanded no gun control be passed at all and showed legislators that we would not tolerate any encroachment on the rights of law-abiding gun owners. While others stood up, while others stood down, NAGR stood up. And because of that, uh, the organization grew larger than anyone could have imagined, and because gun owners were willing to stand and fight alongside NAGR, the outcome resulted in not one single piece of gun control legislation being passed, even though just months prior, it was all but impossible to stop. You see, you don't gain ground on the battlefield by standing down. You don't gain ground by placating to the enemy. You don't gain ground by just trying to lessen the casualties during the battle. You gain ground by fighting to win, whether you think you'll succeed or not. So I want to leave you with the moral of this story that when a fight needs to be fought, it is our duty to plan, prepare, and rise to the occasion just as Daniel Morgan did in 1781. Our, our forefathers did so. If we want our children and grandchildren to enjoy the same freedoms that we have, we must stand in the gap make no exceptions for compromise, and fight the good fight even when the outcome looks bleak. And if we follow in those footsteps, we'll also find that victory is more oftentimes within our grasp than we should expect. And that is why I am a part of the National Association for Gun Rights, and I hope you will be too. Because when we say no compromise, we mean it. So we hope you'll join us in honoring the sacrifice of these young men at Calpens and all across the battlefields of the American Revolution, and we'll do just that by following in their footsteps accepting no compromise, and taking the fight to the enemy every time we're called to do so. Once again, my name is Tommy Demsdale with the National Association for Gun Rights, and I hope you'll join us for just $30 a year. The link is in the description below. Um, all you have to do is click there, 30 bucks, and you get to keep up with everything the NHGR is doing and what you can do to help. Other than that, guys, thank you so much for watching the end of this video. Y'all have a very blessed day.